The Banana King was one of the richest and most powerful men in the world. When a country's government didn't give him what he wanted, he simply overthrew the government. He declared literal war on his competitors, and he built a gigantic business empire from nothing. You see, before he became the Banana King, this man was simply known as Sam, an immigrant with no money, no connections, and no real hope. Sam's journey to building such a successful company is an astonishing underdog story. And throughout his life, Sam became entangled with countless famous figures, from US presidents to business magnates like JP Morgan. And yet, it all begins with ripe bananas. However, I must warn you, what starts out as an inspirational success story will later take a much darker, disturbing turn, as Sam became involved with an extremely controversial company called United Fruit, otherwise known as the Octopus, because of how they wrap their tentacles around everyone and cause devastating consequences. Honestly, I've covered a lot of fascinating business stories, but this is one of the craziest. You may never have heard the name Samza Murray before, but by the end of this video, you'll be glad you did. This is the insane true story of the Banana King. Sam Zamuri was born in 1877 and grew up on a wheat farm in Western Russia. However, Sam's father died early in his life, and this put the family in a very difficult financial situation. Times were tough, and Sam knew he wanted more from life. And he also knew that his uncle lived in America, where he ran a modest grocery store. So at the age of 14, Sam decided to go and join his uncle and try and build a new life for himself. Sam took every last penny he had and embarked on a one-way trip to the United States. Despite arriving with literally no money, Sam's plan was simple, start from the bottom and work his way up. And thus, initially, Sam worked for his uncle doing odd jobs in his store, like stacking the shelves. But Sam always tried to learn as much about the business as he could. He tried to talk to suppliers and customers and figure out what they wanted. Sam also took on a series of other odd jobs. Tin merchant, house cleaner, delivery boy, all was trying to save as much of his small paychecks as he could. That way, when the right opportunity came along, he'd be ready. And that opportunity presented itself in 1893, when Sam's life changed forever. Because in 1893, just a couple of years after arriving in America, Sam saw his first ever banana. Now, here's the thing. In the late 1800s, the banana trade in America was still new, and very few Americans had ever seen a banana before, let alone eaten one. It was considered kind of a strange exotic luxury. So needless to say, when Sam saw that first banana on sale, he was intrigued. He likely bombarded the salesman with questions about what it was and how much it cost. By this point in his life, Sam had realized that to make serious money, his best option was finding a product to sell, instead of just working for other people. And for some reason, Sam was drawn to the idea of selling bananas. After seeing that first banana, Sam made his plan. He would head to the nearby port called Mobile, which is where the fruit boats arrived from Central America. Sam was then going to purchase some bananas of his own and sell them in the local area. It was a simple enough business idea and nobody could have possibly predicted the incredible series of events this decision would cause. Sam traveled to the bustling port of Mobile in Alabama, where all kinds of goods arrived by boat from all across the world. Deals were then struck with salesmen and peddlers looking to buy these goods. When Sam arrived at the port, his initial plan was simply to watch and learn. On his first day, he watched excitedly as a boat sailed into the harbor operated by United Fruit. This company was the dominant player in the banana business, and they imported vast quantities of bananas from Jamaica. Sam observed the process. A boat would dock in the harbor, then a team of men would rush on board in unison to unload all the bananas by hand. There was no mechanical equipment involved back then, and countless thousands of banana bunches on board, so it was backbreaking work in the hot sun. The job was made extra brutal by the fact that scorpions often nestled within the banana plants and would randomly spring out and sting the workers. But as Sam watched on, 
he noticed something curious. After the bananas were taken off the ship, agents from the company sorted them into three piles. One pile was the greens in perfect condition. These were the bananas that would last the longest and thus could be sold for the highest price. They got loaded onto trains and shipped off around the country. Then the next pile was the yellow bananas that were starting to turn. These wouldn't last quite so long, so it was sold to local store owners and peddlers at a discounted price. And then the final pile was the ripes, bananas with black freckles on. Even though these were still perfectly good to eat, they wouldn't make it to market in time to be sold because in less than a week, they'd go soft and start to smell. Thus. As far as the company was concerned, these ripe bananas were basically worthless. Now, back before refrigeration was perfected on ships, up to about 15% of all bananas in a shipment could end up in the ripe pile, as once one banana starts to go ripe, it causes other bananas nearby to ripen too, and thus these ripes were the enemy of those in the banana business. And yet, Sam became fixated on this big pile of ripe bananas which nobody was buying. Whereas all the traders seemed to view them as trash, he saw them as an opportunity. Maybe it was because of his upbringing where food had always been in short supply, but Sam knew a ripe banana could feed someone just as well as any other banana. The only reason most traders never bought them was because you only had about three to five days before they were unsellable. You had to sell them all fast, or you'd end up with a pile of worthless black goopy bananas nobody wanted. And most businesses figured they wouldn't be able to sell them all in time, so it wasn't worth the risk or hassle. But Sam was willing to bet on himself. In total, he had $150, literally his entire life savings from all the jobs he'd been doing in recent years. And so once most of the green and yellow bananas had gone, Sam walked down to the pier to negotiate a deal. For the company agents selling the bananas, this must have been a bizarre encounter. A guy less than 18 years old with a thick Russian accent asking to buy a few thousand of the leftover ripe bananas at a heavily discounted price. However, since the company often couldn't sell these ripe bananas, they were more than happy to agree to the discount Sam asked for. And thus, the deal was done and Sam was in business. He didn't quite spend the full $150 on bananas though, as he used some of the remaining money to buy a boxcar on the Illinois Central Railroad. This allowed him to transport his bananas to various different cities and sell them directly from the boxcar of the train. In theory, Sam's plan made sense. As long as he could sell all the bananas very quickly, he'd make a tidy profit, since he would got them at a discount. But it's important to be clear just how high the stakes were. Sam was betting his life savings on ripe bananas. He was now entering into a race against time as he would have just a few days to sell them all before they went bad. And thus, Sam bought a train box car for his bananas and the train set off the following morning. Unfortunately, Sam had now spent all his money. So whereas most people would pay a few extra dollars to get one of the beds on the train, Sam had no choice but to sleep in the boxcar with all his bananas. But Sam didn't mind. He was excited. He'd done the calculations and was confident he'd have just enough time to sell them all. However, Sam immediately became frustrated when he realized how slowly the train seemed to move. Sometimes it would just completely stop for a few hours while waiting for more cargo or a crew changeover. It was now obvious why most traders never took a risk on ripe bananas. A few unexpected delays meant a trip that was only supposed to take three days could take five days. The bananas were beginning to smell and more black freckles were appearing. Sam was running out of time. Just imagine the stress of watching all your savings start to become worthless right before your eyes. And so when the train got stopped for yet another long delay, Sam ran to a Western Union branch nearby and spoke to the telegraph operator. Sam explained that he had loads of cheap bananas that would be coming through several nearby towns soon. He asked if the telegraph operator would radio every operator ahead and tell them to spread the word to the local merchants, peddlers, and grocery store owners. That way, when the trains arrived in each of these towns, there'd be customers already waiting there ready to buy the bananas whilst the train was stopped. Sam told the operator if he helped spread the word, he'd give him a cut of the sales. And sure enough, this worked. When the train pulled into the next few stations, customers were waiting to meet Sam at the platform ready to buy these cheap bananas they'd been told about. Because Sam had bought them cheap, he could sell them fairly cheap. And by the end of the week, when the train reached its final destination, he'd sold all the bananas. At the end of it all, Sam was left with $190, meaning a $40 profit for a week's work. But remember, this was the 1890s, so that would work out roughly around $1,400 in today's money. It was more money than he'd ever had in his life, and Sam was thrilled. Not only had his first venture been a success, he seemed to have found a niche in the market with these ripe bananas. There was no way he could have competed with the big established companies if he'd been buying the green bananas. But most companies didn't bother buying ripes because of the stress and relatively small profit margins. And so that was Sam's way in. He could be faster than them. 
Within just a couple of weeks, Sam returned to the port once again to buy more ripe bananas and repeated the whole process. And then he did it again and again. Every single trip was a gamble and Sam's life became a blur as he rode from town to town with his box car full of ripe bananas, racing against the clock to sell them all. But before long, Sam had perfected his system and gained a bit of a reputation. He simply became known as Sam the Banana Man. However, whilst many respected his hustle, seeing this young guy going back and forth with his ripe bananas, most people would have likely just dismissed him as a hardworking fruit peddler, nothing more. At that point, they truly had no idea what he'd soon become. Sam moved to live near the docks, so he'd be there first thing in the morning when the ships came in and buy every ripe banana he could. The companies who imported the bananas were always happy to see him, as he was one of the only people who actually wanted to buy their ripes. But Sam developed a system where he would further categorize the ripes based on how ripe they were. Those with just a couple of black freckles could easily last five or six days, whereas the overripes would need to be sold first in the nearest towns. By sorting through them like this, it meant he had a clear order of what to sell first. In 1899, Sam sold 20,000 bananas. By 1903, he was selling well over half a million a year. But in 1903, something else very unusual happened. The president of United Fruits, the largest company in the banana business, asked to meet with Sam. United Fruits president said he liked Sam as he was a risk taker. And during their meeting, the two men agreed a deal. The contract they signed said that all the bananas United Fruit imported that were ripe or turning ripe would be exclusively sold to Sam Murray. This seemed like a win for both sides. United Fruit would have a guaranteed buyer for all their ripes, and Sam had a guaranteed supply of products to sell without needing to endlessly negotiate new deals. What had once seemed like a crazy idea now looked like a very wise business move. By just 21 years old, Sam had over $100,000 saved up, which adjusting for inflation would have made him a millionaire in today's terms. And so if we stop the story right here, it would simply be an underdog success story. But Sam did not stop there. He tasted success and wanted more. The truth is, Sam the Banana Man was just getting started. But before we get to the next chapter, let's talk about you. By now, you're probably very aware that every website you visit is trying to track you in one way or another. But that's where today's video sponsor comes in, Brave Firewall and VPN. With Brave, you simply turn on their VPN in your mobile or desktop, and that way your IP address will be chained so that sites can't see your location, your internet service provider will no longer see all your browsing activity, and your data will stay encrypted so it doesn't get intercepted. The great thing about Brave is you can cover all your devices with just one VPN subscription across Android, iOS, and desktop, thus keeping both your phone and all your other devices safe. Brave VPN even has a built-in firewall to protect against viruses and other unwanted trackers. Not just that, but trying Brave helps support this channel and means I can keep reinvesting in even better videos. So it's win-win. You get an awesome VPN to help keep you safe online, and in the process, you help support Magnates Media. Just download Brave at brave.com magnates to get started, and enter code magnates at checkout for 25% of your first three months. Sam had had huge success selling ripes, but after a few years, he felt he'd gone as far as he could with that business model. Sam now wanted to expand and get involved in even more lucrative elements of the banana business. For example, rather than just buying the ripe bananas United Fruit had already imported, Sam wanted to import bananas himself from Central America. He could make a lot more money doing this, but it would mean making deals with farmers overseas, as well as buying a fleet of ships to transport the bananas to the United States. And all of this meant he needed both help and investment money. So Sam struck up a partnership with a man named Ashbel Hubbard, and together they invested in a fleet of steamships and also acquired a business called the Kayamel Fruit Company, which owned 100 acres of land in Honduras, a perfect climate for growing bananas. The plan was to agree deals with farmers out there, then import bananas from Honduras to the United States. But what's interesting is that United Fruit also agreed to put some money in for a small minority stake in Sam's new business and became a silent partner. Given that Sam's new business would be a competitor to United Fruit, this may seem odd, but actually it was standard practice for United Fruit. The reason the company had the nickname El Polpo, meaning the octopus, is because they wrap their tentacles around every company in the industry. If you were in the banana trade, United Fruit either owned part of your company 
or were actively trying to destroy you. This is how United Fruit had risen to dominate the industry, making countless deals with independent banana farmers, importers and sellers, and then absorbing them into their faceless conglomerate. But United Fruit were strategic about this. Even though they could wipe out all their banana competitors if they wanted to, they deliberately allowed some smaller companies to survive so that they wouldn't be in breach of the Sherman Antitrust Act, which was designed to break up monopolies. So United Fruit let some competitors exist, like Sam and his new Kyamel Fruit Company, as proof to regulators they didn't have a monopoly and there was plenty of fair competition. But the actual reality was that United Fruit dominated the banana industry. They had most of the money, planted the most fields, controlled the supply and demand, and even controlled one of the world's largest private navies, 115 ships called the Great White Fleet. So at this point, Sam was very much a small player in the banana business compared to United Fruit. Of course, moving from just selling ripes to actually importing bananas was a big step up, and Sam was now making hundreds of thousands of dollars per year, but it still wasn't enough for him. Plus, even though Sam was now importing bananas himself, the majority of his money went on paying farmers, sailors, local officials, and working out deals with exporters. The reason United Fruit was so dominant was because they controlled the entire supply chain. Sam realized that unless his business actually grew their own bananas, he could never seriously compete with United Fruit. If Sam wanted to take his business to the next level, he needed to be involved in every step of production. And thus, Sam made the decision to leave behind his life in America and head to the jungle. Sam arrived in Honduras, and it's said that he travelled the entire country by mule as he wanted to get to know the country as well as possible. On his travels, Sam also spent time meeting with many Honduran government officials, looking for special deals so his company wouldn't have to pay the normal taxes and import or export duties. In other words, Sam bribed them. However, this level of corruption was pretty standard. The governments called them concessions. And to be fair, these private deals between businessmen and government officials were kind of essential. The banana business model worked on small margins, which meant needing cheap fruit, cheap labour, cheap land, and no extra taxes or fees. And for a small kickback, government officials were happy to help. So with deals in place, Sam then managed to buy land in Honduras for dirt cheap prices, as the owners considered it worth a swampland. But Sam, who'd grown up on a farm, knew that beneath all the weeds was valuable soil that could grow all the bananas he needed. Sam then began employing as many workers as he could for his banana operation. And it was brutal physical work, made worse by all the snakes, scorpions, and mosquitoes lurking in the jungle. But Sam often worked in the fields right alongside his workers, covered in sweat, swinging a machete as he helped clear the weeds, lay a track, and plant his crop. And thus, Sam and his team began turning these barren lands into fertile banana farms. Sam actually had contempt for his competitors in the banana trade, who mostly operated their business from boardrooms in America, totally detached from the banana lands where the product was actually grown. Unlike most business executives of other banana companies, Sam embraced the Honduran way of life and became quite friendly with some of the people there. He'd go for drinks with the locals and made a lot of effort to learn their language. Sam also told the locals he'd bring them good jobs. And to his credit, he paid substantially more than other employers in the area. Still dirt cheap wages, but less dirt cheap than competitors. In fact, after the fields had been planted, a town was built for the workers, essentially a small village in the middle of the wilderness where they could live. And that's where Sam spent a lot of his time too. Those years working in the jungle gave Sam an experience in the banana business none of his competitors had. They all worked from offices. Sam had been on the front line, and thus he understood every element of the process, from clearing the jungle, to planting the crops, to exporting the bananas, and then the bananas being sold to customers overseas. Sam would later say that the fact he understood every role within the business and supply chain was the real secret to his success. But at the time, his competitors all thought Sam was crazy, especially as there were stories that Sam would often try bizarre experiments. Like at one point, he ate only bananas, then he ate everything but bananas. He also tried standing on his head after meals because he'd heard it was better for digestion. It's fair to say he was an interesting character. But regardless, business was going well. With all of the deals Sam had negotiated, he was able to export bananas just as cheaply as the industry leader, United Fruit. And thus, Sam wanted to keep expanding his business further. He had relentless ambition and drive, and began looking for even more land in Honduras, which of course would require more workers and more money. They'd also have to build more infrastructure, like roads and railways so that the bananas they grew could easily be transported to the docks and shipped off to the United States. The problem was, Sam had already taken out so many loans that no bank wanted to give him any more money. The banana business is risky. 
Bananas are vulnerable to the heat, to the cold, to lack of rain, to floods, to disease. Basically, there's a lot that can go wrong. But Sam spoke to his business partner back in America and explained he felt this was a golden opportunity and they had to act fast to buy up as much of this cheap banana land as possible before anyone else did. They needed to scale as quickly as they could and go all in. Sam's business partner did not feel that way. He couldn't believe Sam wanted to take on even more risk and he instead suggested they should wait and see how things go with the land they already have first and then gradually reinvest after paying off some of their current loans. Clearly, the two men had different visions and risk tolerance and so Sam offered to buy out Ashbell's share of the business. Ironically, Sam took on even more debt to finance this deal. And since he was already maxed out on credit from banks, Sam took on loans from more nefarious organizations, such as gangsters and loan sharks. Some of these charged interest rates at almost 50%. But Sam now had the money he needed to expand even faster. And after buying out his business partner's shares, Sam owned 90% of the company, with United Fruit owning the remaining 10%. Sam now had full control to do what he wanted, and he was essentially betting everything on this. It was literally all or nothing. He was either going to build an empire or lose everything. In the next episode in this series, we'll look at how Sam overthrows a government and goes to war against United Fruit. We'll also look at the dark side of the banana business, which is honestly pretty insane. It involves massacres, CIA coups, and lots, lots more. So just click the thumbnail on screen now to go to part two. I'll see you there.